want you to think to me this morning of verses in the Bible that God compares his character to the love of the mother. We always think of God the Father, but the truth is the Bible paints God as having all the characters, mother and father. So what verse can you think of where God portrays his character as that of a mother? Yeah, Jesus said, I would long to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under the wings. Yep. You're probably right. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's always good to have a student who's not afraid to speak out. So, I want to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. No more? Old Testament? Imagine an Old Testament verse about God being like a mother in a patriarchal society who had no use for women. That's how much God values mothers. Remember he said, he asked the question in Isaiah, will a nursing mother forget her child? You say, well, no, of course you wouldn't. But you know what? Sometimes, because of whatever circumstances, they do. Babies and dumpsters and the whole bit. But then he goes on to say, but I, I will never forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. When God wants to talk about his love, the best example he could think of was the love of a nursing mother. He says, even, even that love may fail, but my love will, will never fail. So, looking at his love and what difference it makes, last week we looked at the chicken or the egg, and it was based on, Pastor Kay was here with us, and he basically said the forgiveness of God is not a reaction. He's not sitting up there in heaven saying, well, you know, when they come to me, if they come to me, maybe I'll forgive them. Pastor Kay said, no, his forgiveness was given before we, before we even asked. We're already forgiven. The whole world is forgiven. So Christianity doesn't usually teach it that way. They usually say, you know, you've got to say your story, and then God forgives. So we're driving home, and my dad was struggling with that. Anyway, I tried to explain it to him, and basically in the end he said, what difference does it make then? What's the point? Why even have Christianity? What's the point? So, what difference does it make to understand that God forgives everyone before they ask? So, then why confess your sins? What difference does it make? So, quick review. So, last week we looked at the sanctuary, which God set up as a model through Moses to teach what? You guys are afraid to answer this morning. To teach what? Why did he, he set this up? Yeah, he wanted us to understand by doing things and looking at things to understand the whole plan of how he's going to save us. You need to understand the Seventh-day Adventist. It's been pounded into you and it's not right. Ellen White says we talk the law, the law, the law until we're dry as the hills of Gabo. And the Sabbath school lesson is always bringing up the law. The controversy is not over the law. The controversy is over the gospel. The good news. That's where the controversy is. Satan wants us to look at anything and everything but. So this was set up to teach us the good news. Now we think of this as, okay, there's a lamb, there's an altar, you, you sin, you bring your lamb, you confess your sins, the lamb dies, you go home free and clear. But there was something else God taught when he had this built that was a teaching for the priests. Here it is. Who do the priests represent, by the way? Jesus. So there, we don't have time for that. <clears throat> so this is Exodus 29, by the way, if you want to look it up. 29 is not on the screen there. It's 29, verse 38. This is what you are to offer on the altar. This is speaking to the priest, not the people. Regularly or continuously, some of your translations say, each day, two lambs a year old, one in the morning, one in the evening, with the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah of flour, mixed with a quarter of a hint of olives, of oil, sorry, pressed from olives. What does flour and oil make? 
bread. So I want you to offer a lamb in the morning, a lamb in the evening with bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? What's the re lamb represent? What does the bread represent? What's the wine represent? What's the priest represent? Are you getting a picture? The whole picture is Jesus. Ellen White says when we get to heaven and we're given this robe, this beautiful white robe of his righteousness, there will not be in it one thread of human devising. Jesus, 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 Jesus. All Jesus. <clears throat> the instructions continue. Sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering. Its drink offering is in the morning. A pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord. And then wraps up with this. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made continuously at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. So every morning the priests offer a lamb. Every evening the priests offer a lamb. Regardless of what the people do. What's the lesson? What's the lesson? Forgiveness is provided morning and evening, day after day, after day after day, after day after day, whether we want it, ask for it, even think about it. We talked last week about the guy, gets drunk on Friday night, comes home, beats his wife, beats his kids, passes out, wakes up the next morning, the evidence of what he has sinned is on his wife's face, it's on his kid's back, it's everywhere. Can he fix it? He can't fix it. But the Bible says he was forgiven for that before he ever did it. So my dad's question is, if that's true, that I can just do whatever I want and God forgives everything, what difference does it make? John says, when we actually come to understand how good God is and how much he loves us, what happens to us? We love him. We love him. Love awakens love. You know what doesn't awaken love? Talking about the law. It does not awaken love. But love does. And God says, you can smash my law, you can trample on my law, you can do anything you want to my law, and I'll still love you. And it's all forgiven before you ever did it. And so the obvious question is, then what difference does it make? Well, it turns out it makes a huge difference. So it was just read for us. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 20. We're going to look at this interesting story. Do you think Jesus purposely tells us things that don't make sense to us? Yes, he does. Do you know why? Because he wants you to think. And by telling you something that doesn't make sense to you, guess what happens? It causes a discord in your mind. You're like, what, what, what? What did you just say? So, Matthew 20. I've always wondered what it would be like to leave church after Jesus preached. People go, no, what did he say? Conference, office, be getting all kinds of phone calls. <clears throat> Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like. Do you know Jesus started almost every story that way? This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. What's the story? We just read it. Guy goes out and hires a bunch of people at different points throughout the day. At the end of the day, he pays them all one day's wage. And what happens to the people who get hired first? Yeah. How would you like it if you worked all day and some schmo showed up an hour before shutdown time and got paid the same as you? You wouldn't like it, would you? And Jesus knew you wouldn't like it. That's why he told the story. He said the kingdom of heaven is like, and he tells the story. He says this landowner hires a bunch of people through different points of the day, pays them all the same. Well, you can't do that. Well, I'm generous. I can do whatever I want. That's the end of the story. What's his point? What's his point? To tick people off so they go home grumbling and complaining about this crazy teacher from Nazareth who doesn't know what he's talking about? The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who makes people mad because he will pays them all the same for doing different amounts of work. Is that the point of the story? So what's the point?
Okay, so first of all, let's break the day down. So he goes out in the morning. So in the Bible, when it says in the morning, it doesn't specify time, that's sunrise. In the Middle East, the sun basically rises at 6 and sets at 6. So he goes out at 6 in the morning, he goes to the marketplace. Because back in their culture, if you didn't have a job, you went to the marketplace and people would come. It's like the job bank. And they would come and they say, hey, you come work for me for the day. So he goes and he gathers a bunch of people and he goes home. At 9 o'clock, he goes back. He finds some more people. He brings them home. At 12 o'clock, he goes back. Finds some more people. Brings them home. 3 o'clock, he goes back. At 5 o'clock, one hour before the day's over, he goes back to the marketplace. But, but the last time he goes, he does something he didn't do any of the other times, or at least we don't know about. Uh, 20, verse 6. About the 11th hour, he went out and he found others standing around. What's that sound like? Lazy. Found others standing around and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle, lazy, all day long? They said to him, Because no one, no one hired us. So, were they willing to work at 6 in the morning? Yes, they were. Did they get hired at 6 in the morning? No, they did not. Why not? Why not? Now, if I were to call up two people up here and say, look, we're going to play a soccer game after church, right out there. Some of you would say, oh, we can't do that. Forget that for a minute. <clears throat> two captains. As those captains look at the congregation, what are they going to start figuring out in their mind? Who of these people can actually play soccer? Who of them can actually play well? Who are they going to pick first? Who's going to get picked last? <laughs> Who are they going to leave till last? The ones they believe are no good and can't play. Right? You've been there. We've all been there. It's like the last guy, captain, who gets stuck picking the last guy because nobody wanted him. He kind of rolls his eyes. He's like, okay, I guess you're on my team. You can have him if you want, but whatever. They're still in the marketplace because nobody wanted them. And if nobody wanted them today, nobody wanted them yesterday and nobody's going to want them tomorrow which means most days they go home and say honey I'm sorry I got nothing I stood in the market all day nobody hired me I got a bum leg they know it I'm missing an arm I can't see out of one eye they don't want me They don't want me. Jesus told another story. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast that a father threw for his son. He made all the preparations. He said to his servants, go out and invite my friends, my acquaintances, everybody I know. Tell them to come for my son's wedding. So the servants go out and they make all the, they give out the invitations. And one says, oh, I just bought land. I got to check it out. Oh, I'm getting married. I'm on my honeymoon, whatever. Servants come back and say, king, like, most people aren't coming. They're busy. What does the king say? He says, go out and invite anyone, alleyways, I don't care, find them, I don't care who they are, how limp they are, how blind they are, I don't care who they are, invite them. I want my wedding's, son's wedding to be full. Do you know that theme runs all through the Bible? Remember, I told, how many times have I told you, if it's true, it should be true from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. When David was anointed king, there was already a king, right? Saul. And God said, you know, just leave him alone. Your time's coming. When it comes, you'll know. The first thing David, he told David to do, you know what he told him to do? He said, I want you to go gather some followers. Gather the ragtags. Gather the nobodies. Gather the troublemakers. Gather the people that nobody wants. That's how I'm going to build your kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out to hire workers. Why would the landowner go at 5 o'clock 
to hire somebody who even if they worked all day might give you one hour's worth of work and then pay them a full day's wage. Why would he do that? Because he's not as worried about his vineyard as he is about that man's ability to go home and feed his family. Now you tell me, what advantage did the people have who got hired at 6 in the morning over the person who got hired at 5 in the evening? The guy who got hired at 6 in the morning had nothing to worry about. All day long, no matter how hot it got, no matter how toilsome it got, he knew that when the day was over, he was going to have money in his hand and everything was going to be fine. But those poor people who sat in the marketplace all day watching hirers come and take laborers and hirers come and take laborers and sitting there and the clock's ticking. I'm not going to get anything today. There are people out there who have a heart like Jesus. You know they do. They don't go to church. They don't do nothing. But they're in their heart. They see someone who needs help, they help them. But they don't know Jesus. And they see the way the world's going and they think it's crazy and they don't know what's going to happen. They have no real peace. You do. Because you know Jesus. That's the advantage. Think of it this way. I don't know how many of you have had the misfortune of being diagnosed with cancer, but I have. It's not very fun. Praise God, I don't have cancer anymore. But imagine this scenario. You get diagnosed with cancer. You go, you have surgery. You get out of surgery. The doctor comes and says, I'll call you in a week and I'll tell you how things are. A week later, he comes, he doesn't call you. Two weeks, he doesn't call you. Three weeks, he doesn't call you. Six months, he doesn't call you. Now, whether he calls you or not, does that change the status of your health? It doesn't, does it? Whatever's wrong or not wrong inside you doesn't change whether he calls you or doesn't call you. If he calls you six months later and says, oh, sorry, by the way, I know you've been trying to call my office. I've been meaning to get back to you. I've been real busy. I just want to let you know everything's fine. You've got nothing to worry about. Is that good news? It is good news. Would it have been better news if you had not had to worry about dying for six months? Would it have been better news if you didn't have to worry about dying for six months? You see, when you find out about Jesus, you don't have to worry anymore because you know the end of the story. It's an advantage in every way to be a Christian, but it doesn't change your status before God. The only people who are going to be lost are not people who can't perform perfectly. It's the people who say, God, I understand fully what you're offering. I'm just not interested. They will be lost because that's what they want. That's what the sanctuary story told. That the day of atonement, when it's all over, when day after day after day after day, the priest forgave you regardless of what you did. On the day of atonement, they said, all you have to do is come to the temple today. A lamb will be offered on your behalf. If you don't want to, there will be a scapegoat who will represent who you want, and he'll go off into the wilderness, and you'll go with him, and you'll go into that, and that'll be over. You choose which lamb you want. You choose which future you want. But it's been provided for the king that you can live forever with him if that's what you want. If it's not what you want, he's not going to force it on you. It's good news, and it's called good news for a reason. And this whole carrot Christianity where it's like, oh, I'm almost there, but I, oh, I can't do that, or I did this wrong, or I did that wrong. Oh, maybe tomorrow I'll be a better, maybe tomorrow. Paid in full from the foundation of the world. Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Father, forgive all of them, for they know not what they do. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. It's done. You can't add to it. You can't improve it. It's finished. And when you find somebody out there who loves the kingdom of God, 
who loves the heart of God, who loves to help instead of hurt, who loves to protect instead of violate, when you find those people, tell them. Your future is secure. This kingdom where Satan rules and ravages, it's on the way out. It's the 11th hour. The workday is almost over. Thief on the cross or Christian from birth, the kingdom's the same. 